Hello everyone, my name is Dan Qualiana, Head of Developer Relations at Zebra Technologies, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Dev Talk. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Darren Campbell, who's one of the architects on our, our team, talk about Data Wedge 6.3. Um, and before we do that, though, I just wanted to just give a little plug for our developer portal at developer.zebra.com. This is an area where if you have any questions, you're looking to do some research, it's a great uh, site to do that. We also, in the developer events section, are putting all of these dev talks, the slides that Darren's going to go through, and then we upload the videos on YouTube and embed that video in there. So if you ever want to go back and reference the material, or even if you have questions that you want to uh, ask, you can, you can ask questions on those. Um, I'm also excited to announce we have a, a number of good, uh, really exciting dev talks coming up. We have a second one in September, September 20th, where we're, we'll be talking about a uh, new IoT uh, platform and kind of what Zebra is doing in the IoT space. And that's going to be led by uh, Adebayo Onigbanjo, who is one of our directors uh, with our software group. And then in the beginning of October, on October 4th, we have... Uh, the Zebra user experience team presenting um, some of the tips and tricks that we've encountered uh, as uh, we engage with enterprise customers and particularly in the rugged space and some of the lessons we've learned around user experience there. Uh, so you can actually sign up for those now if you're interested, going to the developer portal and going to the developer events section, there's an entry for those and we will be sending out invites as well. So I'd like to now introduce Darren Campbell and turn it over to him to teach us about the latest version of Data Wedge. Oh, thank you very much, Dan. That's a really good segue, actually, into why this topic is Data Wedge version 6.3 and beyond. Because, I mean, we'll get into this in later slides, but if you strictly want the latest version of Data Wedge, then you're looking at version 6.5. However, the most relevant version for most people on this call is going to be 6.3. So we'll be talking into why that is as we get into the presentation. So the agenda uh, today, if I can advance the slide, here we are. Just going to briefly cover what is Data Wedge uh, for those, just to make sure everyone on the call is up to speed. Uh, and then we're going to go over the Data Wedge API in general. What is it? It's been around now for a few Data Wedge versions, and it's the area where we're seeing the most amount of features being added to Data Wedge. So uh, we're just going to cover the history of that API very briefly. It's not a history channel, it's a you know, technical documentation. And uh, then we're going to talk about the changes and why 6.3 is really the gateway to start using the Data Wedge API. It's the version where it really becomes useful. And then at the end, we'll talk about some of the changes coming up in future versions of Data Wedge and how you guys on the call, gals on the call, can influence our future roadmap. So Data Wedge in general is what we call our zero code technique for acquiring data into your mobile device. Data Wedge as a product has an awful long history. It's been in the company certainly longer than I have. Originally, it was on our Windows Mobile and CE platforms. And the, 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 the idea hasn't changed. You have a series of inputs. So you originally it was just barcode, but now we have other inputs like simul scan or the ability to capture data via uh, magstripe readers. You do some processing on those inputs. And then the way that that barcode decode is, is output to your application is through one of our output plugins. So very simple technique is to use the keyboard or wedge mode. This is what was originally supported in the, the back on Windows Mobile CE. But nowadays we have the intent output plugin from Android. So I'm able to, without writing a single line of code in the scanner SDK, I'm able to capture data from a Zebra barcode piece of hardware and uh, receive that in my Android application as an intent. So obviously it doesn't have to be a native application, it's just any Android app that understands what intents are. Uh, we also have uh, other output plugins for things like queue busting with our uh, inter internet protocol uh, plugin as well. So that's what Data Wedge is. I, I've got a, an architectural diagram on the following slide, but 
why are we adding an API into Data Wedge? So I, I presume most people on this call are familiar with, with what Data Wedge is, but maybe less so why we have an API. Uh, what we found over the last few months, maybe years, is Data Wedge is our most popular way for people to acquire data in their application. And when we ask people why, why are you choosing Data Wedge instead of the SDK that we pour so much time, resources and, and manpower into, why does everyone keep going back to Data Wedge? The answer is because it just works. It's simple. I don't necessarily want complete control at the very low level. I don't want to have to spawn new threads and monitor what the scanner is doing at the at the code level. I'm happy to just receive an event, maybe a keyboard output or an intent just to be told that data is coming into me. But people have started asking us, Data Edge is great, but I would like to have more control. I would like to be able to disable maybe some barcode symbologies, or I would like to switch profiles dynamically or not have to have the user click the hardware trigger in order to perform a, a scan. Maybe I want to initiate that scan in my code. This is where the Data Edge API comes in. And uh, I put this, this diagram together using the, the basic colors of PowerPoint, so please don't criticize my artistic skills. I'm, I'm not very artistic. But this really shows the difference between what I was describing as the intent output plugin on the right-hand side. This is where you receive, let's just say barcode data, but we can switch that out for simul scan data or card read data. We're receiving barcode data through an intent. This intent might be configured to be sent as start activity, send broadcast, start service. So I can receive all of those, uh, I can receive by those techniques in my application to receive the scanned data. Keep that separate, if you will. That's not part of the Data Wedge API. The API. Uh, consists of a series of commands. Oh, I can use my mouse, can't I? Commands on uh, which are sent from the application to the Data Wedge service. So this is a service, an Android service running on the device. We're just talking about Android for this presentation. The commands are always sent via send broadcast. They're sent with a specific action, which the Data Wedge service understands, and you give it a number of uh, extras in order to specify which commands you're sending. You receive back responses to those commands. Uh, for example, in the earlier APIs, we had like enumerate. So the command would be enumerate the various scanners available. And the response would be, I have three scanners. I have an imager, a camera, and a Bluetooth scanner. As the version of Data Wedge uh, increased, we added more functionality. For example, in the latest version, in version 6.3, sorry, there's a command to say, give me scanner notifications, so it's state notifications. And then a response is sent whenever the user presses the trigger, whenever the scanner is idle or waiting for a command, and you can use that to, to manage the life cycle of your app. So that's the diagram. Let's go on a little bit to the history. There have so far, for, for the purposes of, of this part of the talk, there have so far been three versions of Data Wedge which support an API, and each version adds functionality, incremental functionality. So version 6.0 was, and these, these kind of map with the version of Android uh, where support is first given. So um, I'll, I'll get on to how to determine the API version uh, in a minute, actually. But in version, version 6.0, very, very basic functionality. Uh, you could just start the laser scanner, enumerate the scanner, switch to a different profile. You couldn't do too much else. We were just starting out. Is this something that our customers are interested in? We did get quite a lot of, of interest from some of our larger customers. So the next step was to kind of do it properly, if you if you think of it that way, with Data Wedge 6.2. We changed the the way that you specify the actions for the intents that you're sending. So now everything has a single action, which enables you to send multiple commands at the same time. So you could have a single intent that you fire to say, uh, switch profile and start the laser coming out, uh, just to make up an example. And uh, additional APIs were added to, to perform uh, additional things. Data Wedge 6.3, uh, we're now in to the version that we'll be covering mostly on this talk. And the reason I'm choosing to highlight this version 
is because it's it's the first version where it beca data which becomes a real uh, like it's it's on par with what the EMDK, which is our native SDK, it's on par with what that SDK can offer. You can now create profiles, change those profiles, change the symbologies which are active, and you can do some administration, like retrieve the version information. You can disable data wedge if you want, although that's more of a, an admin function. But uh, you know, this is the first version where you could really use it in a production app, um, I would think. Uh, unless you're doing uh, some, some more of the simple functionality. So I mentioned that you need to know which version of Data Wedge is running on the device. This is, uh, this is very important because Data Wedge is not an application, if you just look at the, the bottom of this slide here, it's not an application that you can update merely through installing an APK or downloading something from the Play Store or App Gallery. This comes as part of the the BSP, you know, the, the operating system. In order to update Data Wedge, you need to update the operating system running on your device. And that, it doesn't have to be a letter update. You don't have to go from L to M just to get a version of Data Wedge. It might, you might still be on L, but it's just a maintenance release update or just a, a security patch update. Maybe uh, they'll, they'll include another version of Data Wedge. Check the release notes for the version of OS that you are updating. You may see some, I would refer to it nowadays as legacy information, where it was possible on a KitKat device to update Data Wedge just by installing an APK. And certainly in the next version of EMDK, that's not going to be possible. I did want to mention it here, though, because it's something you, you may read about. Uh, to retrieve this version, just go to the Data Edge app on the device, menu about, and the, the version is displayed. Here I'm displaying the result of running on a TC51 Marshmallow. You see this is version 6.2. You can retrieve the version with uh, an API, with a Data Wedge API, but that's only going to work in version 6.3 or above. So may, maybe it gives you some indication of whether or not you're running on 6.3 or higher, but um, yeah, it's, it's uh, at the moment you're, you're looking at the manual technique. The reason you'd want to do this incidentally is because presumably you're writing an app that you want to run on a fleet of devices, and you may have a mixed deployment. You might have some MC40, some TC51, some TC75s, and uh, you want to have a application which uses the Data Edge API, but you want to make sure that that API is going to work consistently across all of your devices. So you're probably going to be targeting the lowest version of Data Edge, the lowest common denominator. If I just, uh, I'll, I'll go away from my presentation very briefly. This is our TechDocs website, techdocs.zebra.com. And you see, I can select the version of Data Wedge which I'm seeing. Now, not this is uh, at the moment, it's not as intuitive as we'd like it to be. It's an area we're looking to improve upon. But you see here, I'm selecting version 6.3, and it's showing me the information about the 6.3 APIs only. So just bear that in mind if you're browsing our documentation for some of these APIs. I'd like to say, show you some sample code. This is our simple example of how to start or how to um, mimic the user pressing our barcode trigger but we're going to do that in code so maybe we want the scanner to start emitting the laser automatically when our application switches to a new fragment or, or something like that we could do that by sending the intent as shown on this slide notice how we have a common action here, com symbol data wedge API action. This is going to be the same action used in all of our APIs. This was the from version 6.2 onwards, everything has this common action. And then the extra is defined as the key. You know, the, these are strings, incidentally. So it, uh, often, if you're, like, if I was writing a native Android application, and I expected to interact with some library where I was sending intents, I might expect this key to be a predefined predefined constant somewhere. You know, I, maybe I could import an SDK and it would be a predefined constant. We've consciously taken the decision not to have a library associated with these data edge APIs. The reason being that it 
we want it to be as flexible as possible. You might be using this from a native app, but equally you might be sending this API from enterprise browser, from some other browser like hybrid application. Anything that can send or receive intents is able to use the Data Wedge API. And then we're sending a broadcast. All of these APIs are communicating with the Data Wedge service via send broadcast. That's a simple example. The next example is, is a retrieval example. So here we're, we want to retrieve the available scanners on the device via enumerate. So I set up my dynamic, my dynamic broadcast receiver. So just like I send broadcasts when I want to communicate with the Data Wedge service, the only way I can receive data from the Data Wedge service is by using a broadcast receiver. Uh, I, I can't comment on what we might do in the future. Certainly, uh, we may go down different routes as we could obviously have pending intents or you know, at the moment, the only way that you can retrieve this data is by a broadcast receiver. So I set this up. I'm listening for a result action. Action. Um, make to, and uh, make sure you add this category here. This fooled me for a little while, but it needs to be category default. And then same as on the previous slide, I'm sending my intent with the action and this time I'm saying enumerate scanners. There's no value associated with enumerate scanners. It's just give me the scanners, send broadcast. And then in my broadcast receiver at some point after I request them, I mean, it's, it's gonna be milliseconds, but you know, it's, not, it's not synchronous, it's asynchronous. I receive the scanners as uh, you know, result enumerate scanners in, in this, what's this, a bundle of, well, it's an array list. Oh, it's an array list stored in, in, a, in a bundle here. But the key is uh, obviously consult the documentation. Each API that returns something is going to return it in a slightly different format, depending on what it's trying to return. And uh, so at this point, it would be nice to see a demo. So we don't have, um, so if you go to the documentation on our website and say, well, demo app, Data Wedge demo app, you'll be pointed to the, the demo app that gets pre-installed in all of our Zebra devices. And that demo app does not demonstrate the APIs. All it demonstrates is the ability to receive scanned data via Data Wedge. Now, if you want a demo app which shows how to use these APIs at the time of speaking, your best option is to probably use my personal application which I put together which incidentally comes with no guarantees or warranties from Zebra. Uh, this is just something I put together because I thought it would be helpful and also I was writing a blog post on this topic so I wanted to have something to, to illustrate and just understand it myself but it's available um, for everyone to, to download here. I think it's under like MIT license so please feel free to, to do with it as you will but it, has no, no guarantees associated with it. And I'm going to be showing that uh, some demos on a, uh, in, 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 as a video right now. And so in the past, I've tried to demonstrate things on these broadcasts and it's not gone well because my machine has sort of chopped my voice. So hopefully this demo works a lot better. So just to give you a bit of background, this is the application I just showed, so my personal application I wrote, it's running on a TC55 in this instance with the Data Wedge API version 6.3. So Data Wedge version 6.3 is on the device, so it can it understands the 6.0, the 6.2, and the 6.3 APIs. So I'm going to frequently pause the video and just explain what's going on. Uh, so here, I'm, I'm just scrolling up the UI. You probably don't need me to explain that. So first of all, I'm going to show how like you can retrieve the version information. This is demonstrating the Data Wedge version API. See, it returns its version 6.3. Earlier on, I said there was an API to return the version. This is demonstrating that. I also get various other version information, like simul scan, um, like the scanner decoder, and apparently the the scanner firmware version is not yet available, so I, I guess they'll add that in at some point later. So that's the simple example. Next, I think I registered to receive scanner notifications. So uh, in the background very shortly, I'm going to be scanning a barcode. You obviously can't see that because this is a screen capture rather than uh, a video. But I'm going to receive notifications as broadcasts. And what my app is doing 
is showing those as toasts. So notice how I, I scanned and then once I finished scanning, it went back to waiting. Here, rather than press the hardware trigger, I can use this API. Now this is the same API I showed a couple of slides back for the, the simple code example of how to start the laser coming out to mimic that hardware trigger being pressed. So you can either stop, start or toggle that laser or that trigger. So toggle uh, would just, it's the same as press, pressing it in and then releasing it. It's kind of probably didn't need to explain that. It's kind of obvious, but uh, let's see what happens. So here we see I get, I just toggle the scanner and I receive, hopefully, that's showing up on those toasts to show that I was uh, successfully scanning a barcode or, and then it was waiting for my next instruction. That was the scanner state machine telling me it was waiting. The next function this is demonstrating is the ability to disable the scanner. So I have a tick box here, disable input plugin. And once that's done, the scanner status changes to disabled. Now this is very useful if your application, it has, let's say you have two screens and on one screen, it's just a menu to say, choose which screen you want to go to. And on your second screen, that's where you do your scanning. Now you don't want the laser, you, no, you want nothing to happen when you press the trigger on the menu screen, but when you enter the, the scanning screen, you obviously want the scanner to respond into the trigger presses. In order to do that use case, you could use this scanner input plugin API to enable the input, the scanner, to enable this, uh, this trigger on the scanner page and to disconnect the trigger on the menu page. So that's how you would achieve that. So, and now you'll see I'm, tr I'm toggling the scanner, but nothing's happening. I'm not getting any status updates here. I'm re-enabling the scanner and I think because this is getting annoying for probably everyone on the call now, I'm just going to turn off those register for notifications. The next thing I am going to do is enumerate the scanners. Uh, so, re well, it, it says it here, you can read it for yourself. So, uh, again, I'm re receiving these scanners as a broadcast. This was the code which I walked through two, three slides back. Uh, and so somewhere in this app, it's, it's receiving those scanners and it's populating the, the drop down above with them. So I think I'm just going to prove that this device has three scanners installed. Uh, critically, the, this is a TC55. So the camera and the 2D barcode imager are present as hardware on the device. The, the Bluetooth scanner does not need to be connected uh, in order to communicate, in order to appear in this list. So just to be clear, when I in, when the Data Wedge API is talking about a Bluetooth scanner, it is talking about an RS6000, an RS5000. One of one of Zebra's wearable ring scanners, not uh, a a barcode scanner connected via Bluetooth on the serial port, for example. It's it's not that clever. It's just a managed Bluetooth connection through the scanner. So let's continue with this video and uh, oh, what am I doing now? So here, I'm, this is what Data Wedge looks like. Uh, so I haven't made any changes to Data Wedge at all. At the moment, the default profile will be in effect because the application does not have a profile associated with it. So that's all I'm demonstrating here that I'm not doing anything clever. If I switch back to the Data Wedge API exerciser, you'll see that the active profile here is profile zero. Sometimes I'll need to update this UI because it, it might get out of sync with the actual profile. That's what I just pressed that button for there, but it's profile zero at the moment. Okay, so now I've demonstrated the create profile. Well, that's just clicking, all I've demonstrated is clicking the button. What that's doing behind the screen, behind the scenes, it's calling a couple of APIs. The first one is create a profile. That gives me a, a profile in my list, so I'll now have four profiles, whereas I had three previously, and uh, it just has all the default stuff associated with it. And then I configure that profile through set config, and I set the input plugin, I set the output plugin to be the, the intent output plugin, and the input plugin is, is barcode, and I also associate that profile with this app. And if I press play, I believe the next thing I do is to demonstrate that that profile has now been created. Yep, there it is, DW API exercise a profile. 
and uh, I'm just scrolling down to prove that it does it does have all of the defaults defined. I've I've here we go. Intent output is enabled, and also I've made sure that I've I've configured the correct uh, the the correct action and category associated with that intent output plugin, so that my application can receive them. If you look at the the GitHub README for my app, then it explains what the action the the application is is looking for. And also, I have associated it with my app here, so I shouldn't have really used com.zebra because, like I said, it's my personal app, but um, I, I don't know, sue me. And uh, so, yeah, in theory now, because this is the profile associated with my app, when I go back to my app, this profile should come into effect um, as long as I don't delete it. Yes, thank you. Well done, Darren. Okay, so going back to the application here, if I scroll up, thank you, my beautiful assistant, you see here it says DW API exerciser profile is the active profile. Um, please hold your applause. It just uh, demonstrates that that's working there. Okay, now the next thing, I, so what am I doing here? I'm switching. So even though I am associated with a profile, in this case, DW API Exerciser, I am able to switch to a different profile. So I'm using the switch to profile API, and that's going to transition to profile zero. Now, if I scroll up, you'll see that the active profile, once I refresh, is indeed profile zero. You see it changed there right now. Uh, I, let me just take a moment out here to explain a default profile. So a default profile in Data Edge, if you're not aware, is the profile which is in effect if an application does not have another profile associated with it in its associated apps list that I was showing um, just a little while ago. Now, uh, that default string is, is that's, that's not actually denoting that profile zero is the default profile. It's very, very confusing. Certainly it was for me when I first started looking at this, but the actual this profile that's now in effect is called, the, the name of it is, open quotes, profile zero, parenthesis, default, end parenthesis, end quotes. That's, that's just the string that it's called. Data Wedge does not uh, add the suffix default onto the current default profile. So just bear that in mind as you're, you're playing around with some of these default profile functionality. But the next thing I'm going to do is to modify or change what the default profile is. So what, what I did there, I just minimized Data Edge, minimized the application, come back to it, and because all I'd done was switch the profile previously uh, to profile zero, once I exited the app and come back, the associated profile, DW API exerciser profile, came into effect again because that's the actual profile associated with this app. So I can't remember what I do next, but hopefully it um, follows along what I just explained with the default profiles. Here we are. So now I'm going to remove that association. Okay, so now there's no profile associated with my app. I would expect if I return to the app for it to be the default profile that is now associated. And it, indeed it was, I don't know if you saw it change very quickly here, active profile is now the, the default profile. The next API I'm going to demonstrate is how to change what the default profile is. So this set default profile, I'm now going to change that to, confusingly, DW API exercise profile. So I'm changing the default profile now. I'm not switching it. I'm, I'm not switching the profile for this app. I'm actually changing something fundamental in the data wedge the, the, the data edge service on the device. So that, that's quite a critical thing to understand that I as an application have the ability to influence the whole data wedge service. So, you know, with great power and all that. Uh, so here, just to set the default profile. And now I don't know if I exit or not, but you'll notice that the actual active profile has changed to DW API access profile. That's because that's the default profile in effect in the system. And do I do anything else? I think I do. So I reset default profile. That just changes the, that's the same as doing set default profile to profile zero. It's a convenience function. Profile zero is just fundamental to Data Wedge. It's been that way for years. There'll always be a profile zero. And now I've, I've just reset the default profile back to profile zero. 
we really are going through these uh, these APIs one by one. Nearly at the end of this video, appreciate your uh, your patience here. Feel free to play with any of this yourself. And uh, notice how there's four profiles. Now the very last thing I'm doing here is to restore the configuration. Remember what I said about with great power and all that? Now, oh, well, I've, I've really influenced the system because from the application I'm using, I'm able to restore the whole data wedge configuration. Now, typically you would be using this if you wanted to revert your device back to a factory default settings, maybe without going through the whole enterprise reset, and then you would re-import your data wedge profiles through uh, whichever mechanism you were using, maybe stage now, maybe you were importing them to that auto import directory, I don't know. But in this uh, demo here, I've just restored the whole of data wedge. So it says, um, you know, do you realize what you've just done? So I've, I've lost the profile from the list. Any configuration that I'd previously done to the default profile would have been lost uh, or overwritten by the default configuration. So that comes to the end of the demonstration portion of this presentation. Uh, that was pretty much every 6.3 API. As I say, there were other APIs. There were 6.0 and 6.2 APIs. At the top of the UI, that, uh, so the, the syntax did change over time. I showed earlier on how to look at the documentation for a specific syntax. If that's not clear, then please feel free to, to look at how I've done it in my app to, to access uh, the, the 6.0 way to start the scanner and how that's different from the 6.3 way. There's, there's different techniques for doing each of those actions. So I learned a lot when I wrote that application. And incidentally, I did write a, a blog post about what I'd learned. And a lot of my, we'll call them criticisms, even though they weren't really criticisms, but a lot of what I come to learn about the API was taken into future versions of Data Wedge. So as we move on to the next slide, which is things to watch out for as you code your app, just bear in mind that some of these things would have been fixed or not fixed, but uh, improved, we'll say. Uh, so I covered this before, the APIs changed between 6.0 and 6.3. If you're uh, writing an application that needs to run on a minimum baseline of 6.0, be very aware of which APIs you're going to use and just be aware of the syntax. You need to be using the 6.0 style syntax. Uh, API return values are always via implicit broadcast. This is, uh, so, I mean, if you're aware of it, then in Android O, there's limitations coming up to Android to implicit broadcasts. So I, I can't, it's too early for me to speak now about what we'll be doing about that when the time comes, but rest assured, we will be making sure that applications written now will, um, you know, we, we, we take enterprise considerations at heart when we, when we de design some of these APIs. But for now, uh, the, the return values are always via implicit broadcast. So my advice is to use a dynamic broadcast receiver rather than defining something in your manifest uh, for this. And that's how I've done it in the, in the sample application. Something that got me, and apparently this is good best practice. So this is definitely not a criti criticism of the API, but make sure you define that category default filter when you're setting up your filter for your broadcast receiver. Um, something they've fixed, sorry, made better in later versions of Data Wedge. Remember, um, remember like the, the way to enumerate the scanners. So I sent a command to enumerate and I received back the various scanners on the device. Now I wanted in my app to display the scanners in that dropdown. And I also wanted to, when the user presses the button, to display the scanners as a toast, to say, oh, you've pressed a button, here's a toast of the available scanners. I couldn't do that with 6.3 because there was no way to associate the caller, the, the thing saying enumerate the scanners, with the, the thing receiving the call back. You know, there was, I couldn't add, this is uh, ID one into this enumerate scanners call, and this second enumerate scanners call had ID two. Uh, like I said, that is definitely something that the guys have added into 6.4, we'll, we'll come to that, but for 6.3, just you need to code your application around it. There's no return values from commands. Again, this falls under the, 
uh, the, 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 the umbrella of things which the guys have improved. I say the guys, I mean the, the, the data edge engineering team, but because we're so tightly coupled and we work so well together in, in Zebra, I'm able to call them the guys. It's just a internal way of, of how we, we're really good at working together. Uh, so yeah, uh, you don't, you're not told that the command has succeeded. Uh, if, you, if I say switch profile, to profile made up profile X, which doesn't exist. I as the application have no way of knowing that that switch failed. And you know, this is just something that unfortunately is, we just have to live with in version 6.3, but certainly is, has been improved in future versions. The callbacks, so at the moment I showed the scanner notifications, you were able to uh, receive like scanner waiting, trigger has been pressed, I'm actively scanning, those notifications are available to the app, but you don't have any notification that the profile has switched, like your, your app can't know that the system has switched away from your profile for whatever reason, or maybe my application needs to know that some other application on the device has gone ahead and disabled data wedge or restored data wedge as I demonstrated was possible. Uh, it's not possible for, for your app to get any kind of callback about that, so just watch out for that. And um, profiles come into effect some finite time after launch. Yeah, so there's, uh, it is quite, I'm assured it's very efficient, but there there is something running which, like monitors the foreground application and when it changes then data wedges profile can be updated to the correct profile that happens some you know a number of milliseconds after your app comes to the foreground so what i noticed in my sample app was in my on resume handler i was saying get active profile and i had a profile associated with my application now the active profile being returned from the API call did not match what the associated profile was. And the reason for that was because the API was returning old information because it took several milliseconds for DataWage to realize that I had come to the foreground even after the on resume function handle had been called. So again, just, just bear that in mind. Uh, a couple of bits about set configs. This is the, the API which you use to define changes that you want to make to data wedge you can only modify one plugin at a time uh, so again the, the example here that I faced was I wanted to modify my profile when I click that create profile button I wanted to say I want you to use the the barcode input plugin with these decoders and I want you to use the key the the intent output plugin with this action and I couldn't do that because you can only define one plugin at a time. I mean, the, the fix is simple. You just call set config twice, but um, bear in mind one plugin at a time. At the moment, you need to specify which scanner you are targeting. So if, if I want to make any changes in the barcode input plugin, I need to specify the index of that barcode which I want to change. Now, if I'm doing it in the data wedge UI, it's a lot more intuitive. I just launch the UI, I click uh, barcode input plugin, decoder UPCA disabled, for example. Uh, with the API, I need to say which scanner. Remember there were three scanners when I enumerated, each of those has an ID that enumerate returns. I need to specify that ID when I'm calling set config. This, again, the guys are uh, making changes to this, uh, to, to this area of the code to make that bit a lot more intuitive and simple, but because you're going to be addressing the lowest common denominator, you may well be addressing version 6.3 for some time to come. And uh, the final point here, I, I've gone over this before, but changes operate globally uh, with great power and all that jazz. So just, just watch out, uh, bear that in mind. If, you're, if you and a colleague are both developing a application, make sure they work well together on the same device. And I went all over all of these changes in more detail, although I, I do tend to run on a bit when I type. Um, so there's dis more discussion in my blog there yeah, um, with a, a shortened link. So that's Data Wedge 6.3, everything I've demonstrated so far. And uh, like I say, what you may notice if you go to uh, Tech Docs, uh, Tech Docs, uh, then the latest version of Data Wedge in Tech Docs is version 6.5 here. And uh, I don't want to cause any confusion. There's obviously 
been 6.4 and 6.5 since uh, 6.3 has, has been released. The, the, the team are working on 6.6 .6 as we speak, uh, but just bear in mind, so these are some of the changes which are already in the product. They're already in data wedge. They just haven't made their way into the operating systems of our various products yet. And so some of these changes are confirmed and some of them are still on the roadmap. So things like um, we've got auto scanner selection in, in version 6.4. So remember I said you had to provide the scanner index that you were targeting when you changed the input plugin. Now you can just say auto. So whichever the, 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 the default scanner is, if you just say auto rather than the index, then that it will, you know, it well, probably does it, it does the obvious thing uh, rather than have to specify a specific, specific index. You can get the status of which, whether data wedge is enabled or disabled. Maybe useful if you have two different apps and like that scenario where one app might disable data wedge. Now you can actually get the status. Very, very useful uh, result code. So now from 6.5 onwards, we're able to to know whether that switch profile succeeded or not, or, or any of the uh, APIs. Actually, it's not just the profile APIs, they all have now associated return codes, and these returns are also given by, uh, by, by broadcast similar to before, so I, it might get a little bit clunky, I'm not sure, but certainly the result codes are available for you. Uh, get set disabled app list, uh, things like enterprise browser is by default a disabled app with data wedge. This just gives you visibility and edit rights onto this app list. Switch scanner enables you to uh, quickly, uh, like if you're using the, the imager scanner, you can quickly switch out to the camera scanner. And remember I, I said about defining the, the decoders via the set config plugin. Uh, sorry, set config API. Well, now there's what I presume is more of a convenience method. I can, it gives me direct access to switch the scanner param. So I don't have to worry about the scanner index. I don't have to worry about the the the, the type of the, well, the, the type I guess I do know, have to know about, but it, it can get quite complicated creating the bundle structure to pass to set config. It certainly confused me when I was first trying to do it. And uh, so this, it was very useful to have this convenience method to easily change the parameters of the scanner. And uh, this thing, this thing, sorry, the, the Data Wedge API product is going to be uh, developed continually. And uh, certainly we've seen an awful lot of traction. We've got a lot of positive feedback. We're continuing to receive positive feedback. Our aim is to make this a viable alternative to SDK development. So. Like I say, I had a number of, of uh, issues when I developed my app. I fed those into the team and they're getting actively resolved, which is great. As you uh, guys move forward and you find problems or issues or difficulties with the API, then let us know. Feedback on the community or on the developer.zebra.com and we can get those changes into the product. Certainly, we always happy to hear about feedback and like I say, tell us what you think. So I'm going to end with, uh, what's the time? Uh, and ending with plenty of time for questions. So here's some resources. This is the blog that I put together at the end of June, it looks like, on some of the, the benefits and uh, challenges working with the 6.3 API. Um, if there's enough interest, obviously, I'll update that in due time to 6.5 or 6.6. .6, but at the moment, the blog is limited to 6.3. The a, the app that I showed earlier is available on GitHub and then the, some of the documentation links to the official Zebra documentation. That's taking you straight to 6.3, this URL here. Uh, obviously, the, the alternative is to go to, here we are, just click down 6.3. And then it's, I, confusingly, that takes you to about. So yeah, we, we are working to fix that. Maybe actually, yeah, just, just follow that URL. That's probably the best thing to do. So on that, uh, that fail, to be honest, I'll, I'll pass it back to Dan and ask if there's any questions. Thanks, Darren, that was great. Um, we did have a couple questions. So first off, you, you, you ran through everything in Android. We did have a question around whether there is data wedge for Windows 10. No, there's no data wedge for Windows 10. The, the, 
the reason is because it, it was too locked down an operating system for us to develop anything for that product. So I, I, I don't have enough information to give anything concrete. I know the product teams, the, the Windows 10 product teams were working, trying to work with Microsoft to get something, but I don't know how successful that was. And so I, I honestly don't think that ever evolved into a product, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, this wasn't one of the questions, but just a follow up. Is, is there a brief answer that you can give in terms of if someone is developing a Windows 10 app on a Zebra device, is there a recommendation on how to pull in that scanned information? Yes, there is. Um, it's not something I've ever done myself, but I know there is documentation available. Uh, I believe it's based on, you need to use the Windows 10, they have a barcode SDK, and that that is what you use to pull in scanned data. So at that point, you're writing a, a, a native application. So there's no like data wedge like service running on Windows 10. You need to use the Windows 10 APIs for barcode. But if you, and I don't wanna like try and find it on the call here, but if you go to the product documentation for your Windows 10 device uh, under the, the support, system support.symbol.com I normally go to and then the, the link is from there follow that for your product and that should have links to like product documentation and manuals and they should point you in the right direction for how to start developing a barcode app for Windows 10. Great thanks and one other question we had is whether there are any changes to the hidden profiles in version 6.3 um no changes that i am aware of um, i know the team what the enterprise browser team were always trying to make it simpler to work with data wedge but i don't i don't believe there's been any changes to the, the hidden apps list in 6.3 okay great yeah. Um, and then we, we also got a question, and I, I think maybe you touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but um, maybe another review is helpful for people. When do you recommend using the EMDK versus Data Wedge? So you would use, so performance is potentially a big one. So you're, when you're scanning barcodes with Data Wedge, everything's coming into your app in intent. So if you're just doing occasional barcode scanning uh, or even relatively frequent barcode scanning, then maybe intents aren't uh, a problem for you. But certainly if you're going to be doing an awful lot of very frequent scanning, then EMDK will give you a slight performance advantage because everything's going through the, the native layer. Uh, EMDK does give you more control over the scanner. So like I say, we're working towards making Data Wedge the equivalent to EMDK. So if all of your devices that you're targeting only have version 6.3 on, you can probably, you, you probably have the same amount of control as you do with EMDK, but I'm giving this talk in September 2017, and I can almost guarantee that everyone listening to this call will not have 6.3 on all of their devices. So if you have any deployment with less than that, less than 6.3, then your EMDK is your only choice to have full control over the scanner. Great, very good. So those are all the questions that we had, Darren. So I'd like to just remind people we are gonna be taking the slides and the information that uh, Darren shared, we'll be putting it in the developer portal, developer.zebra.com, in the developer events section. So you'll be able to find the, the link to the app that he went through and, and the other material. And we will work to get the video of this, the uh, recording of this up, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Any other last thoughts, Darren? Uh, no, other than thank you everyone for listening. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us and Darren for sharing this with us. Thank you.